Hi, I'm Mia Friedman, and welcome to No Filter. Most little girls have big, big plans. We plan when we're going to get married, how many children we're going to have, and in what order. We plan what their names are going to be. Hopefully, these days, there's a career plan thrown in there somewhere too, although that didn't figure nearly as large in my little girl dreams for my life as marriage and kids. You know how to make the universe laugh? Tell it your plans. I used to know Chloe Shorten back when she was Chloe Bryce, and we both worked at Clio together 25 years ago, helping to compile the annual list of Australia's most eligible bachelors. What a hideous job for two young single gals to have to do. But we struggled through it. Neither of us married any of the guys on that list, but we did both get married in our 20s and then separated, which was definitely not in the happily ever after brochure. Chloe is an author, mother of three, former newspaper and magazine journalist, and communication specialist and consultant. And in her mid-30s, Chloe was also a divorced mother with two kids, a boy and a girl, aged six and seven. It wasn't easy. Never is. Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin, with their conscious uncoupling on Instagram and their perfect, smiley divorce, have made it look easy. But for most of us, the breakdown of a relationship is awful and traumatic and deeply painful. You feel like a failure. You feel judged by society and by yourself. Eventually, of course, things straighten themselves out and your life continues. And in many, well, most cases, it's better than it was when you were in an unhappy relationship. But when there are children involved, the layers of complexity are multiplied. Like most separating parents, Chloe was terrified her kids would be negatively impacted by their parents' divorce. So after she split up, she went hunting for help, for books, for studies, for information about the best way to do everything from the talk, when you sit your kids down to tell them that their mum and dad aren't going to live together anymore, oh, that is hideous, to introducing new partners, navigating custody, and even eventually introducing new step-siblings or new babies. She didn't find a lot that was helpful. Well, she found a lot of information, but it was all in different places. Chloe wanted one book a guidebook, a map, a how-to manual. So she made one. Chloe's first book, Take Heart, is a guide to navigating modern step families from her own experiences and the experiences of other blended families like hers and different to hers. She writes, I wanted to alleviate my anxiety, empower myself with validating tales of the diverse and wonderful families I firmly believed ours could be. Chloe came into our Melbourne podcast studio for this interview about separation, divorce, remarriage and blending families, if not seamlessly, at least as successfully as possible. And as someone who grew up in a blended family and had their own blended family for a few years there, I found her words and this book incredibly helpful. Here's Chloe. Hey, with any book that's personal, It's not just your story, it's the story of people around you. So when you first flagged the idea with your family of origin and your family that you have created, how did people react? Kids were really supportive and were actually, I had to kind of tone them down about it a bit. My husband was a little bit nervous, but very confident that it, you know, that I had an important story to tell. And my siblings were really worried about what I was going to say about them. <laughs> <laughs> what about your mum? Oh, my mum was great. She, she was. was she kept saying, "Yeah, or you know, I, I would ring her and say, do you remember this?'" And she would say, "Oh, yeah, it wasn't that. It was this." You know. So she was actually kind of giving me a little bit of detail because she's got one of those elephant memories. When you were a little girl, did you grow up wanting, dreaming to be part of a blended family? <laughs> Yeah, nah. I thought that I was going to be doing exactly what my parents did largely. And so I thought, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to marry this type of person and then I'm going to have this kind of life and this many children and, you know, all of their names were picked out and you name it. But um, that was when I was about 12. And then by the time I actually got married, I had grown up a little bit. (laughs) But it was a it was a very it was a devastating thing to have a marriage end and it's very difficult for everybody around you really yes in case you're wondering chloe is married to opposition leader bill shorten that's the shorten in chloe shorten he's her second husband and the one who put the blend into her blended family bill is the stepfather to her two children from her first marriage and the father of the child they had together 
a little girl called Clementine. Also, because being connected to one person in the public eye isn't enough, you've probably heard of Chloe's mum too. Dame Quentin Bryce was Australia's first female Governor-General, an incredible kick-ass woman of kick-assery who is the most elegant human alive and who used to be the Sex Discrimination Commissioner and a magistrate before she was Governor-General. I've seen Quentin and Chloe together. I've spent some time with them along with Clementine and their relationship is as warm, affectionate and close as any mother and daughter I've ever seen. Okay, back to Chloe. I didn't realise you came from such a big family. You're one of five or six Five. Was there any divorce in your family? No. Well, I was the first of our, my generation, but then there were. I, I subsequently found out there was a, you know, an auntie here and a great uncle there, and even someone a bit further back than that. So, but in your immediate family, in my immediate family, you were knew breaking who I was ground. The, yep. Are mm-hmm. you the youngest? No, I'm the fourth out of five, which is kind of nothing in the pecking order because you're not the littlest and you're not the oldest and you're not really a middle child. You're just nothing. You're just sort of the four. It's the lint. (laughs) (laughs) And not the chocolate kind. (laughs) What was your memory? Because I'm from a blended family, Mm. so uh, but I didn't even grow up thinking of it like that. In terms of pop culture, now, Mm. of course, you've got one family and so many depictions of of blended families, but Brady Bunch was really the only one I can think of, and that didn't Mm. seem to be a blended family, did it? Mm. No, there was Eight is is Enough as as well. Do you remember that? Oh, yes. Mm, Eight is Enough. That's right, with a stepmother. Yeah, yeah. And largely, it's either they are big picture, you know, epic fails of, you know, Disney stereotypes or, or, you know, the Brothers Grimm, or they were um, overly romanticised shows like um, uh, like The Brady Bunch. I mean, nobody ever, ever referred to um, Mrs Brady's uh, former husband. Do we know whether or not he Or Mike Brady's or former, was, former you know, wife. They were always yeah. very clean depictions of, yes, of, that's of right. families, weren't they? Even in Cinderella, yeah. there was no pesky biological mother no hanging around no or or you know just and the sort of stereotyping is very unhelpful so when you have role models of any kind you can you can start to peg what you're doing um you know to them and that's really what I was looking for with the book I was looking for where are the stories that show the outcomes are going to be okay where Mm. are the stories that will give me this confidence that if I do things in a certain way the likelihood is that the children will you know, will thrive and, you know, more than survive. They'll f- thrive and be healthy, happy kids. And it was very hard to find that. You know, there was lots of examples and stories about those first few years, you know, when people actually remarry or or divorce and then go off and, you know, become sole parents. There's a lot of personal accounts. And then there's a lot of deep research, clinical research and extraordinary work done by these people um, all over the world. And particularly here in Australia, we have some serious experts on, on blended families and, um, non-nuclear families. How common is it in Australia? Um, two, more than two in five kids lives in a, uh, non-nuclear family environment. So it's, you know, largely 43%. And finding out exactly how many people we're talking about is really difficult because when we look at the statistics, they're based on, um, you know, largely the census and other research, which doesn't necessarily give us all the information we need um, because a lot of people don't want to label themselves. Mm. And that, again, is about the stereotyping. They won't want to... A lot of people won't fill out a census form saying, I am a part of the step family. Because of the stigma. Yeah. Mm. You were married quite a long time. So you mm. got married when you were 25, had your kids at, what, 29 and a couple of years in your early 30s, mm. Mm. and you didn't get divorced or you didn't separate until after, what, it's 16 years you were married? That's right. We were together all, all together. Chloe, that's a years. long time. Mm, like so you say long marriages are not a given in your book mm. and this idea that we all think it's going to be happily ever after. Mm. But that is a long innings. That's that longer had. than the average marriage. The, the, I mean, I, I, that, that was not the whole time we were married. We were married for 10 years and together for another six years before that. But um, e- even in that time, you know, the average marriage in Australia now is about 12 years. And it's interesting that um, the, the divorce rate has actually tapered off. We've actually got lower divorce rates now than we had 10 years ago. Why and, is that? And, well, I think that there was a um, – there was a – a peak or, or you know an, an uptick in divorces when the ch- when the laws changed to allow 
largely, you know, women and some men to get out of unhealthy, damaging relationships. And so, you know, once those those laws changed, um, there were people who, uh, who, you know, I suppose ran for the lawyers. Mm. But then as people started to recognise that that wasn't necessarily always the way to resolve things, I suspect that um, uh, that sort of tapered off a little bit. And I think people have... I would say that interviewing people, I've found that some people have gone into relationships, into marriages, thinking, I can always get out of it, and that it's always a bad thing to do. Is it psychologically a bit like signing a prenup? I don't know. Where you're already think, thinking about the end before yeah, you even I, begin. I, I wonder whether or not there are, and and there's a lot of expertise out there about, about these sorts of things, but when you look at how people decide to that they are going to repartner, remarry, that um, seems to there's a seems to be a lot more thought um, involved in doing that, and I wonder if it's because there are children involved, and you know sometimes the time frame of that is short, but it's there's a lot of research to be done about why we take the steps we take, and that that of course you know shows us that in the first five years of the second marriage that's when you're very vulnerable as a couple and as a and as a young family so I wanted to try and find out what were the protective factors that we could learn for those five years to help strengthen that family and then because then the um, likelihood of failure then tapers off quite significantly in other words those first five years after you've reached that point you're you're a lot stronger and if you can find out what they are for step families the same things apply for any other marriage any other nuclear families so no matter what yeah. number marriage it is yeah so it's not really it's not just a book for step families mm. and you know blended families it's actually got a lot of data in there and evidence about what are the things that you need to do when you're putting a family together to um you know to consider immunize it yeah yeah, yeah and to what? strengthen it and make it resilient okay some chronology because you probably might be wondering Chloe is 46 years old and she has three kids. She was born and raised in Brisbane, the fourth of five children, and was married to her first husband, Roger, for 10 years. They got married when Chloe was 25, but they'd already been together for quite a few years before that. They had their first child when Chloe was 29, and their second came quickly after. And then the couple divorced when Chloe was 37 years old. Their kids were six and seven at the time. She writes in her book, My marriage ending was not easy for me. I felt like I had failed. It was very painful for all of us. By then we had two children aged six and seven and they experienced the stages of grief as though a family member had died. Chloe met Bill Shorten when he was still the union leader. They met through work when they were both talking at a resources industry conference. Bill divorced his first wife in 2008. They had had no kids together. And as a new couple, he and Chloe experienced unwelcome media attention when papers incorrectly reported that Bill had dumped his wife for Chloe. Because trying to carefully blend a new family isn't hard enough without having to deal with gossip and rumours. After a year of living separately and trying to date long distance, Chloe made the tough decision to move her young kids away from their father in Brisbane to Melbourne to be with Bill. Bill's career as a politician whose seat was in Victoria meant that him relocating up to Queensland was just not possible. Another hurdle. More counselling. More change. More research. More trial and error as Chloe worked hard to manage the next round of upheaval in her family's lives. And their daughter Clementine was born in 2010. So... When your first marriage ended, you talked about how that impact in the book. You talk about how that impacted on your identity. Mm. How how was that for you? Well, I suspect for everybody, it's a a loss, a massive change, and then there is a sense that well, for me, um, oh, okay, well that that didn't work. Why didn't that work? Um, what was it that I brought to that situation that you know that I can learn from and I can teach my kids in particular you need to look at if you come from a blended family what the um, lessons are so that your children don't have potentially unstable relationships themselves so relationships of any kind family um, raising children it's all about stability it's not about Mm. what the what the family form looks like so I think um, I stopped being hung up on the form and started to really look deeply at the functioning of the relationship and the family but you know, I, I suppose when a marriage ends, the, the, the two parties 
are at a point where they agree or where one person decides that it's come to the end of the road. But for the kids, they don't want it to end. I mean, mm. assuming it's not a, a situation where there's violence at home or it's a, a, a horrible situation, you you write about your children grieving it like like a death, the end of their parents' marriage. Mm. How do you move forward with your life without trying to hurry the children through their stages of, of mm. grief and processing? That's a really great question. Um, slowly, patiently and um, consistently talking, asking questions, seeking advice. I think we have a an idea that we don't really need these coaches to help us to um, establish our families and get really great habits, that we can just do it by instinct and by sort of... Um, reflecting on our own childhoods and things but as society changes you have all these other um, big big things that impact on your on your family life and behavior from the outside so we should be learning as we go and I love the idea that we should all have whether it's a first marriage or a second marriage um, a coach you know people who can help us um, good resources good books investing in preventive maintenance I call it and so for the children that was largely about making sure that I had a really good expert advice, um, good expert advice. Do you mean and in the that, form of a counsellor? Yep, in the form yep. of a, a, a family psychologist who was excellent. Um, also lots and lots of books. You know, I was reading, I was online, and then I started to kind of start to become really quite discerning about what I would take from some of the resources. So and what, what ground rules, I guess, did you put in place with their father so that they would maintain a strong connection to him? Oh, look, it wasn't really ground rules for him and I wouldn't want to speak for him. But um, it No, was, I mean, it, I don't mean ground rules for him, but I mean ground rules for um, how you two behaved in front of each other, how much the kids spent with him. Like, how did you navigate that whole process? The principle was that the children were not getting divorced. I was. And so the children's, uh, you know, um, relationship and... Uh, um, you know the the love and care for that uh, for those kids wasn't to minimising change, minimising as much of the change as we could. And, and how did you how did you do that practically? That's complicated, how do you and it took change? It, well, it took such a long time. I mean, I'm when moving moving close by, but for some people that's just not possible. And mm. I, and so my story is not necessarily as helpful as it need. You know, as it could. My story is not everybody's story. But sure. for, for me, it was about marshalling as many resources as I could, managing resources, minimising change, and I wasn't really that good at that. And um, initially I was, but then there was a lot of changes at once because the baby came along. So explaining as much as possible and ensuring that the um, uh, that I was reinforcing the love and bond between them and their parent and their dad. So that ha- and that has not changed. But it's taken time and it's taken a lot of. Um, maturity and commitment on on the behalf of three adults to do that, um, as well as the support of family around us. If you have, if you're remarrying remarry, or you, you know you're you're coming out of a marriage, and you have an extended family that is helpful and supportive, and understanding, that has a great benefit for those children. And grandparents, in particular, have a huge role in stabilising children in both of these situations. And so we're really under. I think undervaluing or under recognising just how incredibly crucial grandparents are. Grandparents, step grandparents, you name it. Mm, mm. Um, and I was very fortunate that I had a an, an excellent um, um, mother in law, and um, uh, my parents were fantastic too. The most nerve wracking moment really is sitting down and telling your kids. I mean, I was lucky when my husband and I separated. Our son was young. He was just three or something like that. But with a six and a seven-year-old, that conversation has got to be a lot tougher. How did you prepare for that? With the expert's advice. I actually and what had, was that I advice? actually had a script. Oh. I actually had worked out a script of what, what to say, where to go when this came up. I'd actually prepared FAQs, you know, frequently asked questions. I am such a girly swat, as my editor calls me, <laughs> um, uh, that I had really researched what it was that I should say. So and what is best I wanted practice? the benefit of that to, to apply to other people. Well, um, it, w- it was all scripted to those kids. It wasn't just, you know, one size fits all. So it was largely sure. about taking things very slowly, explaining that it's, um, you know, that 
it's not their fault. It takes a very long time for children to process that they are not the ones responsible for what happens in the relationship of their parents. And so, um, you know, uh, really focusing on that and on minimising the change and explaining as much as possible that, that their parents are there to love them and cherish them and look after them regardless of the fact that they're not living together. They are hard conversations, very hard conversations. But if you look at it through a child's eyes, it's about reassurance um, and, and security and stability. And for them, really, that's what they're looking for. We, there's a lot of research to be done still on the outcomes for kids over time, um, you know, but I did look at a really amazing longitudinal study that was done in the US that looked at uh, grown-ups, you know, 30, 40 years down the track of some of those that first wave of children of divorce, and 80% of them are fine, you know, <laughs> thriving, happy, healthy, ordinary people with uh, um, functioning relationships themselves. The 20% who don't fare well, don't fare well because they have resources taken away from them, and for a lot of people it's, you know, single mums who become quite impoverished, it's lots of change at once, so they have to move to a smaller house. They have to, you know, things are, there is loss compounded on top of mm. the loss of their parent being there. So How did you determine um, custody arrangements? Because that's something that most people find very difficult. Well, that, that took time and it's not really, and I, I don't go into that in my book right. out of respect for their dad. Sure. But um, needless to say that years on now, we have lots of shared activities together including you know we celebrate all the kids things together and um and that 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 does take time and commitment and maturity because that's everybody's ideal isn't it that. the, the yeah, idea of, yeah, of conscious uncoupling and yeah. that you will still be able to come together but in most cases that's just not possible in those early years is it yes especially where there has been you know abuse or violence which is also you know i was listening to a somebody talking this morning, a woman from the University of Adelaide on the ABC radio speaking this morning about the number of uh, uh, assaults that are um, uh, presenting in Victorian, oh, was it Australian hospitals? Anyway, some huge amount, 20,000 or something a year, and 10,000 of them are related to um, intimate partner violence. So we've got a long way to go towards supporting, I think, you know, men in the community, um, most Australian men are absolutely fabulous, gorgeous, like my husband. But, <laughs> but you know, we've got a long way to go to support the entire uh, subsystem, I suppose, of, of each one of these families. And um, I, I'm hoping a bit of a step in that direction. In terms of your status as a woman, you went from your identity as being a married mother of two in your community mm. to being a single mother. Mm. Did you find you were treated differently? Uh, in very subtle ways and probably only and only afterwards, but I found things like the expectation that being a, a sole mother with two kids, that I was um, under more pressure to uh, perform well in the workplace because even though nothing changed in, in terms of my daily um, uh, you know, commitment to my, my job and my work, it was this sense that, well, she's... You know, she's separated or she's on her own with kids now. It must be harder and therefore, uh, we, you know, we should maybe pull back on this bit of giving this responsibility or... They were very subtle. Um, did you appreciate that understanding or did you find it no, patronising? I, 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 um, I, I was quizzical about it because um, there wasn't any change in my capacity uh, other than my time commitment, you know. For you. What but about socially? Socially, I just, uh, a, a lot of people surprised me and some people really disappointed me. And I think that that's the, um, one of the great learnings in, in any lessons in any uh, big change experience that you have. You know, there are some people who will delight you who you never would have expected. Um, and then there are some people who will let you down and, and you, you wouldn't have expected that either. I think that's something that surprises a lot of people. They think about ending the relationship. They think about the impact that that will have on the kids. They will think about the practical sides of where they're going to live. But few people realise, I think, how dislocating it can be socially because so much of your life is built around you as a family unit and you as a couple. Mm. So 
from your relationship with your partner's extended family to, you know, couple mm. friends that you have, mm. all of those things really shift, don't they? And they're all they very do. much disrupted. They do for you and for, and for your partner, but for your children, there must be continuity. And having a commitment to that is, is really vital for the children's well-being, that they have this sense that they will still see their cousins, they will still do those other ritualistic things, that uh, traditional things that they had done before, and that can be really tough. So the people who often can provide the greatest um, bridge to do that are, you know, siblings and, you know, aunties and uncles and, and grandparents, and uh, that um, shouldn't be understated, I think. Dating as a single mum. Little girls don't grow up dreaming of that either, do they? No, I don't suspect <laughs> they do. I don't think little boys do either. And again, it's not this stuff is not reflected in any of our no. general mainstream, you know, content and popular culture. So, so how did you go about that? How did you go about when when you met Bill introducing him to the kids very slowly and with no expectations and with no um uh pre um kind of um, labels on what the relationship was at that time. What did, did you just were like explaining this is a friend of friends? Were out. Yep, yeah. that's right. And um, were they very yeah. protective of you? No, they weren't really. No, <laughs> they were just happy little, happy Guys. little. Um, you know, and I suppose that they probably would have had confusion at some time. But we were taking advice along the way, and um, so I think we're fortunate that we did that. I think we're really fortunate. One of the things that, that you, you write about at the end of the book, you, you talk to Bill and, and ask him what his, advo- like, what his advice would be, mm, mm. and he said, be their friend, Yeah, which is so interesting because it's the polar opposite of what parents are usually advised to do. It's like, don't be their friend, be their parent. Yeah, but with trap, a step trap parent, for young players, that one. Yeah, mm. so tell me the difference about that and how a step parent needs to approach kids. Um, the great phrase that I heard a woman called Patricia Paper now, who's one of the sort of gurus in the field, um, she said it's connection before correction. Before you assume the role of the disciplinarian, whether you, particularly for, for the, the bloke, um, which is often what society expects of a male in a household, is to make the connection, to be a friend um, and just get to know them and build trust with one another and a relationship. And then if they're that child, depending on their age, of course, too, then um, over time builds up that relationship that can lead to that person, you know, the other person making some rules or reinforcing those rules, that's great. But that doesn't always happen and you should, certainly should avoid going into it with those expectations. Similarly, stepmothers have a really complicated time of it because society expects women to go into relationships and be the nurturer and the organiser and the domestic, you know, um, arranger. And naturally, women tend to fall into that. And that is a, a real trap and can be very difficult and create all sorts of tensions because the children really aren't necessarily wanting that. Um, and yet that's often where she falls. So the, so the um, partner has to try to help her not do that. And then she, again, makes the connection and the friendship. And sometimes that doesn't even work out. Sometimes, you know, you, you, there is no great deep bond between a stepchild and a stepparent. And as long as there is respect and kindness there, then that's, that's good enough. Mm. So it's really understanding taking the pressure down for those people, for the, whoever it is that's the new person, and also respecting, allowing the, the original parent to have a bit of space with those children on their own. So going from that um, sole parent time where you're actually really in, intensively in that relationship and almost exclusively because you're focusing on their well-being, um, going from that into a relationship It's important, I've learned it's important um, from all the studies that I've read that that little bubble can have time on its own as well and that that shouldn't, even though sometimes it makes the other person feel excluded and on the outer, that that's okay and that the relationship between all of them can still be healthy with that that in mind. You and Bill dated for about 18 months before you moved to Melbourne with your kids, which I imagine was 
um, difficult in itself, a difficult decision mm. between having them stay close to their father and, mm. and then moving to Melbourne. Mm. Um, and then you guys married in 2009 and had your daughter Clementine together in 2010. So I wanted to ask you about that. It was your third child and his mm. first. This is, this mm. is quite common in blended families that mm. you've got someone who's done it before uh, mm. and someone who it's all brand new. Mm. How different were your experiences and how did you manage it for your two, first two children? Well, you know, there's that vague sort of fugue state of memory that I have about those first few <laughs> months with the baby. I think I've blocked a lot of it out. And, and that sleeplessness that is so terrible. I do remember having all of them in bed with me quite a lot. And, yeah. um, you know, so there was desperate to get sleep and going past my bed, patting my bed, my pillow, I love you, bed. <laughs> and um, so that's really the first six months. That's what I remember the most. Um, adjustment of, of of any kind with with a new baby, even with a nuclear family in a mm. nuclear family. Um, let's let's say. Um, what are the extra family. challenges for a blended family? The extra family challenges because what we had was the age gap too. So we had that seven eight year age gap. So the children were old enough to realise that this was. Um, that had some benefits, them being older, because they weren't, um, you know, going through that terrible sort of toddler, toddler baby rivalry. But they were uh, adored her and were treated her like the little precious little deity. And um, that bond of them being a little bit older and loving that baby so much was really quite a, you know, a gift. So it was like, it, it was, sounds like it were, Clementine was quite a binding factor yeah. in the new family unit. Yes, and I, and I put that down to the approach that we took, the extended family support we had, and the age, the ages of the children. When you say the approach have, that you took, what do you mean? The approach being going into it with this really <laughs> nerdy study, you know, research. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, laboratory method I used. Well, I was constantly ringing people and asking them things. I'd, I'd, I'd get onto the raisingchildren.net website, tips? you know. Oh, look, I'd be sitting in the pantry and the children would be sitting at the dinner table and there'd be, you know, the baby in the high chair and the two little ones and I'd be going, how do I handle this question or whatever? So I'd go into the pantry, which is one of those sort of walk-in pantries, close the door, get onto my, <laughs> get onto my laptop and type into the raisingchildren.net website. I am sure that there are questions in that website on that resource that are just my questions that they've rehashed because <laughs> they're so bizarre. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's that, it was that, um, that SWOT approach that I took that I think was helpful. You know, I've, I, um, I'm trying to find some examples for you, but things about um, conversations, not shutting down conversations in, you know, oh, well, we can talk about that later or take going down the rabbit hole with the kids whenever they went there and, and allowing them to go as far as they wanted to go with it, which meant, you know, lots and lots of questions and then the answers would be, just hang on a second, I'll come back to you. <laughs> yeah, so, I think that's you know, important sometimes. Yeah. You don't have to answer every question in the moment. But no. in terms of um, you, you kept seeing a family counsellor or you, mm -hmm. have you yeah. been back and yep. forth yeah. to navigate? And, and, and I've actually added other experts along the way of people that I will speak to um, either in a formal or an informal sense when things come up. So I think that families, if they can possibly get those resources, and a lot of them now are, um, are in, you know, in libraries and um, on, on the web. Um, and that is absolutely critical to, for us to say to ourselves, actually, we don't have all the answers. This is not easy. Parenting is a great privilege and a great challenge, and it, it does not come naturally. Testing one, two. It's a podcast about family life, normal family life, and then maybe not so normal. Why can't you be like other mum? Like, you know, how do you tell your nine-year-old you go into prison? You failed it. Or how do you retire in your 30s and travel around the world with your baby? You nailed it. Can you have a wedding and not invite other people's children? This glorious mess. It's called This Glorious Mess. Subscribe to us in iTunes or your favourite podcast app. You write that you used re this research to make sure your family was moving through the stages correctly. Mm. What 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 did you find the stages were? 
Well, I suppose there's that sort of, you, they, they're often the stages that you have in, in a first marriage too, which is the sort of the fantasy phase, you know, this unrealistic expectations about how things are going to go. People don't necessarily tell you. That's informed largely by your own childhood, your own experiences and lots of movies you've watched, you know, yeah. books you've read. Um, so there's that, there's that um I suppose busting that myth really busting all those myths next and coming down to the point where you know that um, where the difficulties start to bubble up which is another another stage really is starting to understand what they are and recognize them for what they are then mobilizing and um, r realizing that you need some support and some help and expertise and then moving through the stages of um, the action from that mobilisation stage, acting on it, implementing them, uh, recognising that you're not um, that you're not perfect, and that these these things are fluid and take time. You don't need to stick to traditional roles of a, of a nuclear family. Trying to replicate them won't work. You know, largely, a step family, a blended family, is not a subset or a subcategory of a nuclear family. They come in all shapes and sizes, and in Australia, it's the functioning of the family, not what it looks like, that's the more important thing. So focusing on that function, understanding that there are stages that you go through and that you'll come out the other end stronger, happier, healthier, with more resilient kids. I think the most interesting thing that you you said was was that it took time to get to that point where you can celebrate those milestones together mm. and mm -hmm. you can be... You know, the heat goes out of it, I suppose. The heat goes out of the breakup mm. and you remould your family around this new shape. Managing expectations as you go into it is really important. I think one of the things that I had learned um, from uh, one of the uh, specialists was to lower your expectations of how long it takes. It takes five years, not five months. You know, it can take three years, not three months. And rushing through only puts more pressure on you and your partner and the kids. So slowing down, taking the pressure off, not trying to uh, conform to other people's ideas of how you should be creating and supporting your family, asking people for help and support, reaching out. It's a very difficult thing to do. Women do it all the time when they have their first babies, but they often have you know, maternal and child health nurses to help them do that, to put them into networks. I'd love to see um, uh, support, some sort of support networks in the community for, um, for blended and step families and for sole parent families. Uh, there are 63,000, according to the census, grandparents in Australia raising grandchildren. I'd love to know who it is that reaches out to those people. So it's understanding that um, it, it doesn't just take a village to raise a child. It takes a village to raise a family mm. of any kind. And so... Um, there is, uh, you're right, there is no one size fits all. But for anyone who is experiencing um, either creating a new family or perhaps evolving from the shape of one family to the next, Take Heart, your book, is a fantastic place to start. Chloe, thank you. Thank you and so much. And congratulations. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to your book too, Ooh. by the way, just quietly. Scary. <laughs> I know, we're book sisters. Yeah, we are. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Mia. <laughs> This episode of No Filter was brought to you by Telstra Smart Home. Telstra brings you the magic of technology with Smart Home, a clever little app that lets you manage your home from anywhere, even this podcast studio as I'm doing right now. Thanks for listening to No Filter. As someone who grew up in a blended family, um, I really found that amazing. I mean, blended families, not many people had blended families when I was growing up. I have... Um, a half-brother. My father is my mother's second marriage and she was a single mum when she met my dad and I didn't know anyone like me. I, I really didn't and I, there were certainly would have been no books like Chloe's for my mum to read and there were none for me to read when my husband and I separated um, and we had to navigate everything between us and with our son who was about two or three at the time. So I highly recommend this book, which you can buy at apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia, where you can also buy my book, Work Strife Balance, where I interview my mum about what those years were like and what it was like being a single mother um, with a young child and not being able to um, have any control over your life back then, how hard it was. I mean, imagine being a single mother in the 60s. At iTunes, I mean at iBooks, you can also subscribe to all our other shows in one place or you can get the Mamma Mia podcast app from the App Store 
or you can go to the iTunes store. There's so many options, but I would just go to the app store and download the Mamma Mia podcast app because that's where all our podcasts are. And sometimes we're launching them so fast at the moment, you don't want to miss out. Please leave us a review on iTunes for this podcast or any of the Mamma Mia podcasts that you listen to. It really, really helps us to keep producing our podcasts and bringing them to you because the way that iTunes works and the way that the um, podcast charts work is that it relies on reviews and it helps more people see our podcasts if you share them and review them and leave ratings for them. If you want to suggest a guest... Just ask me a question. Call the pod phone on 02 899 9386 um, about my book, about Chloe's book, or you can flick me an email at podcasts at mamamia.com.au. Today's show was produced by the lovely Eliza Ratliff, and she's just the best. For the Mamma Mia Women's Network, the executive producer of podcasts is Moni Bowley, who's also the best, and the head of entertainment is Holly Wainwright, who, like Monique and Eliza, is also the best. I'm Mia Friedman. I'm not the best, but I'm trying. Lots of love. See you online.